For those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Angela Fierro. I'm an adjunct professor here at Tonsis. I teach uh, political science and sociology, and I'm so excited um, to bring this presentation to you guys today. Um, I'd like to thank first and foremost our panelists. We have uh, former Assistant Attorney General Sherilyn Lebowski, we have Attorney Scott Sandler, and we have the Honorable Curtissa E. Cofield, who is currently presiding in uh, Superior Court for Juvenile Matters in New Britain. So I'm very, very pleased that they took time out of their schedule today to be here to talk with you guys and to share a dialogue with you about what happens in juvenile court. Um, I also have a couple of people that I'd like to thank before we get started. I would sincerely like to thank Dr. Fran Cohn for helping me get this off the ground. Um, he, he was fully uh, supportive of my idea to bring this to you guys to you, so thank you Dr. Cohn for all of your support. Um, and I would also like to thank the staff from our MIT department and our IT department for recording this presentation and also for getting the microphones for us as well. Uh, and one more thank you uh, to my husband for getting the cookies today. Thank you, honey. <laughs> um, so the, cookies, the cookies got the applause, apparently. Um, so welcome, everybody. I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased to bring this to you. Um, for the faculty, do you guys remember quite a few months ago when we had to engage in a training, a mandatory training, um, that required us to learn about what a mandated reporter is? No hands. I remember it. Okay, now the hands are going up. Um, yeah, you know, it, it's interesting from the perspective of the student or the faculty member. You guys are viewing juvenile court and abuse and neglect from the potential position of being a mandated reporter, not necessarily and hopefully not um, being, being a parent or a child, but the, the view of the mandated reporter law I have up here on our, our screen. So mandated reporters are required to report or cause a report to be made when in the ordinary course of their employment or profession, they have reasonable cause to suspect or believe that a child under the age of 18 has been abused, neglected, or is placed in imminent risk of serious harm. Okay, so the state has this codified for a reason. We want to protect children, okay? Um, and there are certain professions, many of those uh, which you guys are studying about, um, whether that be social work, early childhood education, um, if you are planning on going into police work, probation, parole, you are in a unique position to be able to view children in, in their home settings or in their school settings, or as a therapist. So there is an extensive list that I want to bring up to you because there are some on this category. Let's see if this hyperlink works. Oh, There's an extensive list of mandated reporters. Now, how many of you are from the dental hygiene program here? Were you aware, you may be, that you are, um, by law, a mandated reporter? Okay, so this list um, is something that you guys going out into the field, once you do graduate from here uh, and go on with your studies, this is something that you will become aware of when you start working full time. Um, so we have a, a, an exhaustive list here of anyone who could potentially come in contact with children. What I find very interesting here um, is the first line, any person paid to care for a child in any public or private facility, child daycare center, group daycare home, or family daycare home, which is licensed by the state. That seems like a no-brainer. If you have your license from the Department of Public Health to care for children, that you would be um, a part of this list as a mandated reporter. But if you scroll down, uh, persons paid to care for children. So if you happen to be uh, a nanny who's paid to care for children, you might want to think about whether or not you have any reasonable suspicion or if there are any red flags uh, that you've seen that uh, could, could potentially call for you to make a report to DCF. Um, so what is abuse? You know you're a mandated reporter you know you, you've potentially been exposed to a situation where a child may, uh, may, in your mind, be in a position to be abused. Well, by law, we have very specific definitions. Abuse is defined as a non-accidental injury to a child which, regardless of motive, is inflicted or allowed to be inflicted by the person responsible for the child's care. 
So this next section is, is pretty important here. This includes any injury which is at variance with the history given. So you have different people reporting different stories as to what caused the injury. Um, and maltreatment, such as, but not limited to, malnutrition, sexual molestation, deprivation of necessities, emotional maltreatment, or cruel punishment. So that's, that's a pretty broad um, spectrum of things that could potentially happen to a child um, and, and potentially wind up as, as an abuse allegation. Um, there are three different types of abuse. For those of you who are taking sociology classes or social problems, you guys are familiar with this. Uh, and I'm also guessing in the early childhood education um, classes, you guys have, have gone over this a bit as well. You, you not only have physical abuse, something that's visible to you as a mandated reporter, there's also the sexual abuse and the emotional abuse. And you would see those displayed in various ways by these children. Some of it is not obvious because it's not on the face, it's not somewhere, <clears throat> excuse me, where you would see it right away. But you might notice a child acting differently, becoming withdrawn, depressed. I see someone nodding their head in, in agreement with what I'm saying. You know, so the signs of abuse can, can come across in many different ways depending on, upon the type of abuse and the type of child, okay? You also have neglect. It's the failure, whether intentional or not, of the person responsible for the child's care to provide and maintain adequate food, clothing, medical care, supervision, and or education. Okay, so, so when do you find the child's been neglected? When that child's been abandoned? Is being denied proper care and attention physically, educationally, emotionally, or morally? Is being permitted to live under conditions, circumstances, or associations injurious to his well-being? Or is being abused? Okay, so those all qualify under this umbrella of neglect. And there, the, the last slide said it, but there are different types of neglect. You have your physical neglect. You have your medical neglect, educational, emotional, and moral. So it can come in all different forms, okay? And I think that's important for you guys to know once you, you know, wander out into your full-time jobs and you are in these fields where you work with children as a matter of course, that you can recognize that neglect, um, like abuse is not just one thing. It can come across and be displayed by different behaviors by the child, okay? Um, so that is, that is your connection to abuse and neglect and to juvenile court as a mandated reporter. What happens after that is something that not everyone knows a lot about. Because juvenile court is a closed courtroom, we don't allow the public in to listen to the arguments, to see the parents who've been um, alleged to have uh, committed the acts. Um, we, we want to protect the child, so we keep the courtroom closed. Um, and many people, since I've been working here since 2009, I've fielded several different questions over the years from students who are wondering, you know, what happens there? You know, if I make a report, am I called in as a witness? Um, you know, do the, do the parents, uh, you know, get denied their rights? How does that happen? There are many, many questions that I've been asked that I'm hoping that this panel can answer for you today. So I'm going to turn it over to Attorney Lebowski so that she can talk about the state's case and how they would proceed in this type of a matter. Um, thank you very much. Thank you all for coming today. Um, I've been, before we get into the actual court involvement, I just want to talk a little bit about what happens when the department, can you hear me okay? No? no? Back here. Is this? I want to talk a little bit about um, before the, the case even comes into the, into the juvenile court, what the Department of Children and Families does um, to bring the case before the court. When the department gets a referral, and it can come from, from any individual, from a mandated reporter, from anyone in the community, they're mandated by law to do an investigation. They'll go out to the family, um, if it's a, a report of physical abuse, physical neglect, substance abuse in the home, what have you, they'll go out, um, do an investigation, speak with all the parties involved, speak with the children if they're of an age, that they're verbal and, and can um, give a report to them. And we'll do their independent assessment of whether or not they feel the child has been abused or neglected in any way under the, the statutes of the state of Connecticut. If they feel there is abuse or neglect, and if they feel that they're not able to work with the family independent of the court, um, very often they'll They'll try to put services in the home. They'll make referrals for different services. And if the family cooperates with these services and 
shows a benefit from the services, the court doesn't have to get involved. But if it's a case where either the family's not able to make the benefit from the services, not willing to be uh, cooperative with the services, or doesn't feel that there's any problem in their home, the department very often will have to file a petition in the juvenile court. Um, in cases where there's been serious phys physical neglect or physical abuse or um, sexual abuse, the department will at times determine that in their assessment, the child would be at imminent physical, imminent risk of physical danger if they were, to, if the child were to remain in that home. And when that happens, the department is under law allowed to take temporary control or custody of that child for up to 96 hours. It's called the 96-hour hold. And during that time, the department will um, prepare affidavits, where the social worker will write what their involvement has been in the home in the case why they feel that the, the child is at risk of physical danger if it's a case of very serious physical abuse, if it's a case of sexual abuse, and they believe the child is not going to be protected by the family. Within the 96 hours, they will file what's called an order of temporary custody in the juvenile court. And the, order, the request for the order of temporary custody is done on what's called an ex parte basis. All that happens is the, the social worker will prepare affidavits, again, saying why they feel this child's at imminent risk. The affidavits will be submitted to the court and will ultimately go to a judge, such as Judge Cofield. Judge Cofield will review those affidavits, and based on just the, the paperwork presented to her, will have to make a decision of whether or not she feels the child is in such danger that he or she should not be continue to be in the, the care of the parents. If the, the judge doesn't feel that the department has given her sufficient information to, to determine that the child's in imminent danger, the child will remain in the care or return to the care of the parents. If the judge does feel that the child is in imminent danger, the department is then granted what's called an order of temporary custody. And that order of temporary custody will remain in effect until it is vacated by the court. Um, the parents will be served with a copy of that order of temporary custody along with a neglect petition that will state, uh, the documents will state all of the reasons the department feels their child has been abused or is in danger and um, why they feel the child needs to be out of their care. The parents then have the right to have a hearing within 10 days, which is set, the time frame is set by the court, to come in and say, we disagree with this. We didn't do anything to our child. Department has it wrong, their investigation is flawed, we can explain the circumstances our child should return to us. Um, that 10 day hearing is what it's called, uh, will be held at that time, the child will automatically be appointed counsel. Um, the parents have a right to come in and either re come in with their own counsel or request counsel through the court if they're financially eligible for court appointed counsel. And they have someone such as attorney Sandler who would represent them. At that 10-day hearing, they would say to the court, we want to fight to have our child return to us. We don't agree with the facts this presented in the, in the department's case. Or they may agree that we know we have some problems. We have some substance abuse issues. We know that the child was, was, was abused or neglected, and we need to clean up our household before the child can return home to us. If the parents do want to fight to get the child back, a trial will be scheduled, and that trial then has to be scheduled within 10 days of that initial 10-day hearing. At the trial, the burden is on the department to prove that, prove to the court that the child is in imminent risk of physical danger at the time that the child is removed from the home and remains in danger at the time of the 10-day hearing. The, um, the department would need to call a social worker to testify if the social worker submitted an affidavit. They would need to call any police officers that might have been involved. If there was a drug bust in the home or there were police officers that saw injuries to the child, they would need to come in and testify to what was in any affidavit to police reports. If there was a medical doctor involved who saw the injuries of the child in an emergency room, they would need to write an affidavit and then come in and testify to what they saw and why they feel this child is in danger. And then again, it's up to a judge such as Judge Cofield to decide whether or not that child was in fact in imminent danger when the department submitted their initial affidavit, or if 
if the child is, is safe enough, the situation is safe enough for the child to return home. In the, in the case of whether, in the case of with an LTC being sustained by the court, with the court saying, yes, the child needs to remain in DCF custody, or at the 10-day hearing where the department or the family agrees that the child should stay in DCF care, the court orders what's called specific steps. And the steps are targeted specifically to address whatever the issues were in the case. If it was a case of physical abuse, there would be parenting expectations that the parents would involve themselves in services such as that. If it was a substance abuse case, um, there would be substance abuse treatment and assessment that would take place. If there was a case of domestic violence, that um, the violence was so severe in the home that the children were at risk, the family, the mother and the father would need to be involved in domestic violence services. Once the steps are set, the department is, on an ongoing basis, is working with the family to, to get the services in place, to help them benefit from those services, to make sure they have transportation and whatnot to get back and forth to the services, as well as to visit with their, their, their children on an ongoing basis. While that is all taking place, the court case remains in effect. Um, parents are working with their attorneys, the social workers are working with the families, the AGs are working with the, uh, the DCF workers, and we'll monitor or review the case um, at what's called a case status conference to see are, are we making progress in, in the case? Are the um, parents benefiting from services? Can we put in place a plan of ret return? If there's still outstanding issues, and very often, unfortunately, there are, the department will then most likely seek what's called an order of commitment where the child will no longer be under temporary custody will then have their guardianship transferred to the Department of Children and Families. Again, the parents may agree to that. They may recognize that they have services and, and issues that need to be addressed. And if so, they can order, agree to the order of commitment. If not, they can have a trial again on the, on the issues that were, were presented as the basis for the neglect and the abuse. And again, the judge would then decide whether or not the, um, the child should remain in DCF custody or if the child can return home to the parents. Uh, an alternate disposition to an order of commitment is an order of protective supervision where the child is able to return to the parents but under court supervision. The specific steps that were ordered earlier, or as I discussed earlier, will remain in effect and the family will continue to involve themselves in those services the department will need to write status reports to the court on a regular basis and we'll have in-court reviews on a regular basis to, to see how things are going. And hopefully, at the end of that period of time, anywhere from six months to nine months to a year, the case would be able to be closed. However, in cases where the child is committed, at times the family is still, or always the family is still able to continue to work toward reunification, but there are times when they they just aren't able to successfully reunify. They, they either don't go to the services, they don't show a benefit from the services, they may drop off a visitation with their child. And the department then is obligated, um, if the child remains in care for a period of 15 months, the department is obligated to file termination petitions. And in that case, they're seeking the, the total severance of the parental rights, that the child can no longer be considered the legal child of, of the mother and father. And again, department um, would, would file petitions based on grounds of the parents failed to rehabilitate, they had abandoned the child, they had committed such a serious abuse or act against the child that their rights, because of that, that act should be terminated or because the abuse should be terminated. And again, ultimately, either the, the, the parents could agree to a, a termination of parental rights or they could take the case to trial department would be obligated to prove that um, by clear and convincing evidence that the child should remain out of the parent's care and that their rights should be terminated. I know that's a lot of information in a short period of time and um, probably went through it much too quickly, but I'd like to turn it over to Attorney Sandler who could then describe a bit of the defense of, of uh, the market. Can you hear me in the back? If you can hear me in the back, raise your hand. Excellent. 
Good morning again. My name is Scott Sandler. I'm a private attorney uh, located in West Hartford. I've been practicing in the area of juvenile law for 21 years now. So I represent the parents who are accused of the abuse or neglect, rightfully or wrongfully. I represent grandparents or aunts and uncles who may be seeking custody of children that are in DCS care. And a long time ago, I used to represent kids in juvenile court, but I haven't done that in a very long time. So again, I'm representing the people who are uh, mostly accused of the wrongdoing. Um, I can go into the court process a little bit from my perspective. I can go into client interviews. I can go into whatever people would like me to. I would like to, if it's okay with everyone, to just ask, does anybody have a question that they really want to be asked about the Department of Children and Families, the court process, or anything? Anybody just have a question? Yes, ma'am.
child is being denied proper care and attention at home, his emotional needs are not being met, and, and the, the facts to support that would be that there was an assessment done, the child is clinically depressed, he's in need of services, counseling, medication, the parents are not following through with getting those services. If the child was actively suicidal and was concerned that he might actually harm himself without this treatment, that could be the basis for that. Just for purposes of making sure everybody can hear you. Thank you. Um, now, when a parent is being accused of some crime against their child and the child is being assessed, does the parent have any say in where the child goes? In other words, to send them to an aunt or to a grandmother, or does the court just take full control? It, it really depends at what stage things are. So taking it from the beginning, if DCF had taken an order of temporary custody or had requested an order of temporary custody and the court had granted it, technically DCF is not allowed to get the child a haircut without the parent's permission. Um, they can't, child can't travel out of state without the parent's permission, things of that nature. DCF is required to investigate uh, the availability of family members to take care of the child. Those people will be vetted, of course, and they need to have no child protection history, no criminal record, and their living situation needs to be looked into. I'm talking about a house that's in Connecticut. If the house is out of state, it's a much longer uh, process, and that can take months. So to answer your question, DCF is required to look into the availability of family members. Now, and unfortunately, Sometimes mom and dad don't tell DCF about family members because they don't want the family to know <laughs> what they're going through. So um, DCF is only as good as the information that they have. DCF is not going to contact family members. They want family members to call them to show that they are interested in caring for the children. In terms of providers, do the parents have a say in what provider a child goes to um, in general? For better or for worse, DCF has contracts with providers, Wheeler Clinic specifically, and uh, more often than not, children receive services either from Wheeler Clinic, Klingberg, uh, unless the parents have private insurance and something can be secured through their private insurance. I just note that that's only after DCF has temporary custody or, or guardianship of the child. If a petition hasn't been filed or the court hasn't adjudicated neglect or perhaps the family is free to go to wherever provider they want. The department can certainly make referrals and offer assistance located them. But, um. So, at, you know, as an aside, and I realize it may not be exactly the focus of, of what we're supposed to be talking about, but in terms of if a parent had come to me before DCF has either taken the 96 hour hold or asked the court for temporary custody, I would say to them, under the facts and circumstances, are there any family members available? because perhaps before DCF wishes to do something, you might want to run to probate court and transfer the guardianship of the child to a relative that's suitable and worthy so as to keep DCF from being able to do something else with the child. Any other questions? I just want to know, like, is if there's like a percentage of something of the children that lie about being abused, like they're not really being abused, you know, they're just being forced to go to soccer practice and they, they're thinking that's kind of abuse. Is there like a percentage or something? What I will say is that, you know, so for example, the parents that I was meeting with two days ago with the DCF worker present who was doing an investigation was because their child who they believe was going through some things, they couldn't exactly figure out what, went to the therapist and said, Daddy's hitting me. There doesn't seem to be any indications that that was in fact true, but the therapist was only as good as the information that he had received. He had never met the family before and made a referral to DCF. Some therapists might not have. Um, some therapists might have said, I need to look into this more before I make this referral. Um, so the percentage that lie, I have no idea. Um, that child could have changed his story because after the parent had said
said, if you don't change your story, you're going to be taken away from us. Uh, there are a variety of circumstances. So DCF and the courts, and, and Judge Cofield certainly can uh, tell you her version, but children um, at various ages, uh, you know, 15-year-olds lie because they weren't allowed to go with their friends. Five-year-olds lie because, well, they, they're not lying. They just can't remember what they had for breakfast. Uh, so I think that DCF and the court try to painstakingly try to collect as much information as possible. The problem is, and understandably so, the best example is an allegation of sex abuse, which is DCF and the court cannot assume it to be untrue. An allegation of sex abuse, of course, is the worst allegation that there is. And if we assume it not to be true, we may be having a child be maintained in a situation where they continue to be sexually abused. So in those cases, I believe DCF and the courts, quite frankly, um, are extra, extra careful, uh, pull the trigger a little sooner than perhaps with some other types of cases. And that so is really to freeze frame the safety of the child uh, and to make an assessment as to whether or not, one, if the allegation is true or not, or two, and quite frankly, if your teenage daughter is alleging that you were sexually inappropriate with her, maybe you didn't do it, but there's something else going on, why else would someone make such a horrible allegation? So in other words, just because the original allegation comes into something doesn't mean that there aren't other issues that are presented in the family. And I can just piggyback off of that comment. Um, in the four years I worked at DCF, I can't, I can't even remember the number of cases and the number of families that I dealt with, but I do remember there was only one child. In the four years I worked there, there was only one child who made a false allegation against, uh, against a parent, and that was it. Every other case, uh, there was something there to substantiate. So it's, it's a very small percentage, I would say. And I would say the, the department and the court wants to look out for these children. It's their job. They, they want to err on the side of caution. They want to fully investigate any allegation that's made, even if it might appear on the, at the outset that the, the allegation might be a little bit flimsy. Yes, sir. Let me, oh, can I just get him to say it into the microphone so we get him? Okay. Do you think it's more of a class issue? I, I believe me, I'm, I'm a, I have radar for those kinds of questions. I, I look for that. Um, just as I look in this room to see the diversity in this college, I'm always on, on alert for that. And I've often wondered, was it just a racial uh, category of people? Was it just a class of persons? In fact, I think you are going to be very successful because you just read my notes. I had it right here. Um, <laughs> there are all colors, uh, all classes uh, of people, all income levels. Do we see more lower income level people? Yes, for the most part. But nobody is really exempt from what the definition of abuse and neglect is. Um, I note uh, classes involving uh, cases involving people who, for example, adopt, is it, is it Russian? Um, yes, Russian uh, children and bring them here. And, and not, it requires just a lot of skill and knowledge uh, to parent uh, children who have what is called reactive attachment disorder. So these children go to school and do things like courting. And to go to Russia and adopt a child costs a lot of money. So you're talking about somebody in a high income level. But now, because of the behavior of the children, they find themselves also sitting on that side of the table um, as it relates to abuse or neglect, if anyone wants to add in. But yes, it, it's usually more of a class situation. Um, it's clear that people who are on a lower economic scale tend to have children earlier, tend to have less options, tend to have parents who are incarcerated. One in six children in Hartford school system has a parent who's incarcerated. Could be both parents. Not necessarily. I'm just thinking there's people who are usually most of the short sighted lash out quickly. But anybody can have a short view. Somebody who's really on um, well degree could have a very frustrating job 
and not have the skills to really deal with, now let me go over into my, my parental role. So I, I wouldn't say that, you, you just can't make any assumptions that just because someone has a certain uh, income level or educational level that you just don't look at their kids. I used to, I still do joke, I grew up in Simsbury and I used to joke that we would have had more GCF cases in Simsbury, but the houses are too far apart. You can't hear what's going on, whereas in the cities, um, you know, where people are living in apartment by apartment next to each other, you get the neighbors calling, um, you get the, the school calling because they, they tend to know the families better. Uh, so I think it's just, but in terms of how the courts approach it, the courts analysis, I hope to God that has nothing to do to do with it. It can't have anything to do with it. Um, I would note that, you know, you had asked about uh, being better educated. Um, you know, education may go towards your, maybe you just have a better ability to receive services, to understand and gain insight as to the issues that your family faces. But there is no way in hell that people are immune from frustration because of, I would suggest to you that in many times it is escalating, okay, because you get these supposedly very high functioning families, but if there's a crack in the ointment, they can fold just like any other family, have problems just like any other family. Substance abuse among lawyers, very high, all professionals very high, so to think that it's a socioeconomic uh, problem. I think uh, I agree with Her Honor. Um, statistically, there are probably more cases from inside New Britain than the surrounding towns. There are probably less referrals, also. So, the better question might be, and I can't. I don't think anyone up here can answer it. Is are the mandated reporters less likely to report something from Simsbury than from New Britain? I can't answer that question. Yes, sir. Kind of related to that question, uh, mine is about culture. I'm just wondering what impact, you know, our desire to have some sort of cultural sensitivity. You have a, an immigrant background where immigrant parents may be more likely to, to hit. Uh, and if that's the case, uh, what kind of sensitivity should the courts have with that? compared to a standard definition of abuse that well, it has to take into consideration. I would say that you two are reading my mind somewhat. At least I've made my notes and, and you allow me to speak about them. Because I think that a lot of uh, maybe African American people might fall in that same category. Um, and people in my generation feel that it didn't harm them and it really kept us out of trouble and look at where we are. And it's not against the law to use cor corporal punishment or to spank. There's a specific statute that allows spanking, but, as my notes say, spank at your own risk, because what's a spank and what's a slap and what's an abuse? So you just got to be forewarned. I've seen cases uh, where, uh, one case where a minister uh, was charged criminally for uh, the mother to take the children and to be spanked by him, and he was charged but he was found not guilty. So it's just like, who wants to go through the trial to have, you know, to have it determined? So it's probably better to try to learn other ways, and so I think that some of the specific steps would allow people to learn other ways to be able to talk to their children. Mrs. Fierro is going to give you a copy of a case called Lovan C, it's L-O-V-A-N C, period. <coughs> which is the case that talks about the fact that that is a question of the child's age and ability to understand and the nature of the discipline. So the idea that you can't spank is not true. You punch your five-year-old in the face, that's abuse. You spank your 10-year-old, maybe not. Uh, it's a case-by-case, -case. there's no bright line test. No. I think it would depend also on what kind of marks where the spank, hitting someone in the face is not, I don't think by any stretch of the imagination, a spank. Um, 
most, most people think of spanking as being a slap on the buttocks or something something in that area, not something on the buttocks that we've had people, kids who've been slapped on the buttocks but can't sit down because they have extreme bruises. That's, that's not spank, so. I will say too that um, I have represented a number of specifically, and, and I don't mean to say specifically that the problem is culture, but my best recollection is when I represented uh, Jamaican parents who, so I've never been to Jamaica, but supposedly physical discipline is, I don't want to say accepted, just done. I don't know that there's a debate. Um, and it, it can be very harsh in our estimation. And so the woman was saying, but this is what we do. And I say, well, your choices are to change or move back. So we're not going to change the laws because of the rules because of where you're from. The ability to understand maybe why you're doing what you're doing may, again, contribute to your ability to change. The, the guiding rule is always uh, the best interest of the child, and certainly the parents should be able to parent. But we are, we, we've learned a lot, and they have been in this field longer than I have, but you learn a lot. And I learned in Latino culture, um, for example, one way of punishing children is to make them kneel on rice. Has anybody ever heard of that? Yeah. Can you imagine? That must really hurt your knees after a while. You know? So you, you've got to be sensitive to these things, but still, ouch, isn't there a better way? A lot of that has to do with um, educating the parents as to different alternatives of discipline because we do come into this world with our unique perspective, right? Your family is a culture unto itself. It has its own traditions and your parents are, are likely going to employ the same discipline techniques um, that they received when they were growing up. We've talked about this in, in my sociology class and I, I'm going to assume that, that some of the other classes have as well. You know, your the way you are brought up will inform you as you grow as to, you know, what discipline um, is you are going to employ when you have children. The idea then becomes how do we broaden that thinking to include in your mind frame without taking away any of your culture or your traditions, but teaching you through the specific steps and through parenting education classes, how you can better discipline your child to avoid um, any type of abuse um, and so that your relationship with your child can continue to be a healthy one. May I speak about relationships? Absolutely. One thing that always surprised me is that I always felt, I'm going to just tell you a little bit about my life. I did a lot of criminal law as a state's attorney and then did a lot of criminal law mostly. And um, so I, I'll describe what we do, the good, the bad, the ugly. The good is the adoptions, the bad is the criminal law, and the ugly is what happens in child abuse court. That affects all of us, and it, that is probably the most difficult to deal with because we're dealing with very vulnerable people. But just to say quickly, I always thought that a child, especially a male who grew up seeing his mother with a black and blue or slapped around, would be the last guy to grow up and do the same thing because he is empathetic for his mother, but it's just the opposite. It's just the opposite, and I, I still haven't understood that, but I'm just piggybacking on you. You kind of do what you learn, but sometimes, why would you take that side of what you learn? It's, it's just a very strange, I have that. That's my question if anybody has an answer. <laughs> well, the same is with al alcoholism as well. You would think that a child of an alcoholic would never pick up a drink, but the experts will tell you about genetic disposition and predisposition and so forth. I did want to say something about um, going back to the mandated reporter issue. In your professional lives, if you believe that abuse or neglect has occurred, you can't then try to educate the parent as to what they should do next time and not make the referral. You still have to make the call. The fact that you believe that the person understands now and won't do it again is not up to you. That's why the word is mandated. So please just try to remember that. I realize everybody tries, people feel bad, this is a nice family, I don't want to make this call. Um, you do so at your own risk. Uh, and so, again, uh, it's not discretionary, but it's mandatory. And that's a great point. Um, I've had the occasion uh, of having students in class who, who um, have strongly disagreed with the Adrian Peterson 
case. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. That's a perfect example of how your socioeconomic status does not make you immune from um, perpetrating abuse on your child. He took a switch and beat his four-year-old, right, the professional football player. Um, so I, I've had students say, well, that's, that's not abuse. Um, I, I can't see it as abuse because if that's what his parents taught him and if my parents taught me something similar to that, then I wouldn't qualify that as abuse. What I'd like to point out then is that you know, if you are a student going into a field in which you are a mandated reporter, you may have personal views on, on these issues. What you need to do is make sure that your views line up with what the law is and what is considered abuse and neglect because you don't want to put yourself in a position um, where you're not making the call because personally you may feel otherwise. The law will tell you um, what you need to do. So it, it's important that you guys are aware of that when you do go out into these fields. Do we have any other questions? At the, oh, yes, we do. Excellent. Um, can you just address um, medical or health abuse? Our dental hygiene students deal with lots and lots of children in lots of different settings, and they get very emotional thinking, oh my gosh, this kid has had cavities for a year and nobody has done anything, that must be abuse. At what point do you sort of pull the trigger and, and report it? I know there's not an exact sort of, but what are some of the signs that would make you tip the scales to report lack of access to care as opposed to just calling parents out and training. Uh, I can only speak to the types of referrals the department receives and um, certainly referrals from, from hygienists, from, from medical doctors that the child has you know, a series of cavities that um, are not being treated properly, parents are missing appointments, mom is causing great pain for the child, you know, perhaps developing abscess, things like that. Um, Again, there's no bright line, but um, medical cases where the um, child, you've had cases of a girl with diabetes and then the mother was, or the parent was not you know, giving the insulin properly. It was, it was a tough case, but what I would call it is that it was a teenager who also had some control over what she could do for herself and was refusing it, but the, the responsibility was going back to the mother to make sure that, that she's able to give herself with the insulin or you know, help her with the insulin itself. Um, cases of, I think in the case I had as a social worker, a little boy that had cancer on his face and um, required you know, removal of a significant portion of his nose. And it was, it was a tough case in that the, the, the parent did get the actual medical care for the child, um, did follow up, but then the reconstructive surgery never took place. And I remember a discussion at our office of, is this, it could be a, a poverty issue, um, although we were able to get the funds for it. But the, the mother just never followed through with getting, get, getting that, that you know, necessary. This child's emotional well-being in the future and for his, his well-being overall, getting that kind of treatment. Um, I don't know if that So would the first steps be, I'm hoping, maybe somebody from TCF would get that child to drive. The problem is they can't drive there or the parent. Uh, well, we would be working with the parent to, to make the appointment. No telephone in the home. You have to look at the basic steps. Is there no phone? Is there no access to, to even make the phone call? Is transportation an issue? What can we do to assist with transportation? The department's not going to become the taxi service, but they are going to have an obligation of. of we, we have a medical cab for, for people that are um, on, on the state assistance. The department is going to be obligated to, to try to come up with a resource. Um, look into family members at that point. Who else can help? Is the father not actively involved? The father, he makes it. And then you'll know, try to address every issue that's keeping the, the parent from getting that care for the child. And then again, if it's, if it's a situation where the child's really being neglected under the law because they're not getting the dental care, the medical care, what have you, then the department might have to take a step filing a neglect petition and bring the court to the And another area in which there's no bright line is um, educational neglect as well. There's no say if you miss 10 days, your parents are going to be uh, told that that's educational or what, but if, I, I don't understand it, you know, my, parent, my father's way of uh, discipline me was to look at me, he had the, 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 the stare of Superman, it, 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 I didn't need very much more than that, but, and, and then he was a minister too, and so, you know, when they said, Father God, I thought I'd better get my act together. 
that, you know, a lot of the parents just some, for some reason now, and I don't know if this is because of the invention of video games, the kids just like to stay home and play video games all day, kids don't want to go to school. A, a lot of kids, especially once they get to the eighth grade, ninth grade, gets a little harder, they don't want to go to school. And a parent will actually tolerate a child not going to school maybe for a year, six months, and the school, in Britain, they actually are able to figure out where, who's supposed to be there. Sometimes heart gets a lot larger, you just get lost in the crowd. Um, you get your education in prison. That's what happens. You've got to learn one way or the other, and I'd rather see kids learn in school. I see a question. What do you do with the siblings of using like, the other sibling? That's a tough question. So I've had many, I've had, I should say, I've many. Um, in 21 years, Mr. Lebowski was a practicing attorney for many years and her honor on the bench. Certainly have seen cases where one sibling sexually abuses another, or at least there's an allegation of it. Um, so if that's the type of fact pattern that you're considering, um, so the one case I had, uh, the parents came to me because their child had disclosed that the other child had abused her. And so the first thing I told them to do was to call DCF on themselves. That may seem silly, and what kind of lawyer would do that? But the idea was, well, this kid is going to disclose at some point. You're better off getting out, getting out in front of it, showing that you understand you will take the steps necessary to protect the children, and then maybe you can keep your family together. So what we did was we came up with a plan with DCS blessing where a father was gonna sleep in one room with one child and the mother was gonna sleep in the other room with the other child, and DCF. And again, one unit might have said something and another unit might have said something else, but this unit that we were dealing with at DCF um, said, okay, that works for us, that was fine. That's an aberration. Most of the time, the allegation comes in one child abusing another. Again, may or may not be true, but until we figure it out, those children are going to be separated. And if the parents aren't willing to separate those children through some voluntary arrangement, DCF will do it for them. And one and or both will be removed. It may be the alleged victim. It may be the alleged perpetrator. It may be both. Because then the concern, and again, this is where the literature comes into play, is if one child is abusing another, well, where did they learn to do that? And now we're concerned about the parents too. So to answer your question, that is going to be some significant DCF involvement for a significant period of time. Because those cases never go away. And I don't think it's all that infrequent because of the blended families today. Uh, I would say that a lot of the women that we have who come as, uh, who are the ones who are actually facing uh, the abuse by neglect charge, have themselves uh, been abused and neglected by a, a family member, or sexually assaulted by a family member, and especially with blended families and, and people leaving uh, children unsupervised after they're 12, or, which the law allows, but the children really need it. Um, some barriers. So I don't think it's all that infrequent. And Scott didn't talk about that part, but there, the other part, but the other part of juvenile is uh, the delinquency, which is the, the, you know, not to criminalize children, but it, it is like a criminal pr proceeding. And that child who's been abusing may be charged with sex assault one, depending on what the allegations are. And in that case, if the judge approves, it comes to uh, delinquency court. That could be, um, the child could be prosecuted as an adult, depending on age, and it, it, when they have to go up to the criminal court uh, as on a mandatory report, mandatory review, and then it can come back down to the delinquency court. But the worst thing that could ever happen to any uh, one is to be branded with uh, a sexual predator registry, or on the, on the registry. So it, it's very, it, it's very common. If I could just bring in some of the curriculum that I know you guys have, have been discussing in class, you know, Judge Cofield just laid it out perfectly for you. When you are attached with a status or a label, such as a sexual predator, a perpetrator, 
uh, of something heinous like abuse and neglect, it is very, very difficult to shake that. And if you are prosecuted in criminal court, uh, that is open to the public. That's not like juvenile court. If you get transferred over uh, as a um, as a teenager, if, if you get transferred over to the, the adult courts, you're going to be treated like an adult. Um, so this is something to keep in mind as we're talking about these parents, as we're talking about these, these child victims um, who may also have these labels attached to them. Think about what that must be like for them growing up being, uh, being known perhaps in, a, in their family circle or in their school setting as a victim. That's also a very difficult label to, to uh, shake off. I see another hand. What if the parent is the one who's getting abused? The child. The juvenile. Well, then that ends up on the delinquency side. Parent goes down and makes a complaint to the police, and usually the child gets a citation for an assault. And unfortunately, I, I would prefer to, if that would then be treated like the family, like the adult cases where there's um, a protective order and there's family services and the case had to be seen the very next day after the complaint but uh, unfortunately that doesn't happen in delinquency but parents have rights not to be abused as well and if I just ask that what may happen in that case is that if it's a very serious case and they just can't live under the same roof that child may then come into the department of the families with an OTC that's given out prevention and delinquency court saying this child has nowhere to live um, and can't go home with mom, mom will take him back, or it's not safe for him to go back there, for mother to have him back there. And he then becomes a under the temporary custody of DCF and goes through the, the Department of Children and Families and the neglect side of the court as, as well. There's one person uh, missing, not represented at this table, and that's a person called Guardian Ed Lido. And when you have cases involving a parent and child, or in the case you spoke about earlier, where there's a sibling, and now the parents and the sibling, one sibling gets arrested and the other sibling is the victim and the parent is just in an untenable position, there's another person who would then be called in and I'll have Scott discuss that. The, the guardian ad litem in juvenile court, their, I don't want to say sole responsibility, but their primary responsibility is to advocate for what they believe to be in the child's best interest. So for example, when you're appointed as an attorney for a child, you are to do what the child wants. So you basically could meet with a child and say, well, what, who would you like to live with? And a 15-year-old girl says, well, I'd like to go live with my Uncle Stephen. And so then you're going to go into court and you're going to advocate that your 15-year-old client live with Uncle Stephen. You're appointed as the guardian ad litem for the same girl. You would tell the court, judge, I met with the guardian ad litem. I met with the child. It is true that she wishes to do this. However, because Uncle Stephen is on the sex offender registry, I can't recommend that, and I don't believe that to be in a child's best interest. So, in general terms, an attorney advocates for what their minor client wants, and a guardian ad litem advocates for what they believe to be in the child's best interest. That is often not the same thing. Anything else? Any other questions? In regards to the children, um, like the siblings attacking other siblings, a lot of times I've noticed that the person doing the abuse ends up back home faster than the victim. Why is that? Well, as Attorney Sandler had noted earlier, in cases of sexual abuse, if they cannot live under the same home, they're under the same roof safely, one of the children will be removed. And unfortunately, my experience as a worker and in, in, in um, the AG's office is very often it's the victim that's, that's removed. Um, and I'm sorry, I've, I've already lost track of <laughs> Well, I, I think part of it goes to your victim may need some specialized services. It may not be, be functioning at a healthy or a safe um, level to be able to be back in that environment where he or she is um, subjected to the presence of the perpetrator maybe um, you don't it would depend on on the case but yeah you if you are um, the victim of sexual abuse it may take you a longer time to work through the treatment process 
um, to, to feel whole again. And that might be what's preventing you from being back in your family unit. It might be the treatment process itself and when you are ready to go back to that home. Because if, if the judge, and I, I may be speaking out of turn here, but if the judge determines that the child is not ready based on therapeutic reports and psychological evaluations, um, it's not going to matter that the sibling is back in the home. It's going to matter, you know, what do we need to do to, to continue on this path towards, uh, towards mental health for this child, and that might be to keep the child out of the home. There's a very practical issue, too. Where do you suggest we place the perpetrator? I'm just wondering in regards to, I feel like an abuser needs to just... Can you speak up? Yeah. I can't hear you. Could I just get you to stand, and I'll, I'll give you the mic? I, just, I feel like an abuser need as much treatment, if not more, than the person being victimized because that can continue and they could continue to hurt people. So I feel like... You've got to remember what I said, that the abuse is not just walking away. There's that criminal side. We don't really think of it as criminal. Delinquency side where he's going to be going through a lot of evaluations, assessments, hurdles. And it's just, you know, then the victim may not want to go back and face him right away. So we're, we're really not social scientists. I try to keep myself up on um, what's going on, but I, I do look closely at the reports of those who make recommendations who are psychologists or are psychiatrists. What's in the best interest of that victim? And a lot of times the family is, is putting a lot of guilt on the victim as well, and the, so the victim doesn't want to go home. So there, there's just so many um, different aspects to The department immediately is looking at what's the best resource for the child. Um, they have, and I, I'm hoping they still have it, they have a considered removal team meeting. And at that meeting, they'll bring in the parents, they'll bring in family members of the parents who willing, are willing to have come in, and they'll talk about these are the issues, this is why the department is seeking removal of your child, this is why we feel the child's not safe in your home at this point. And they'll immediately start looking at relatives. Um, there's been a push throughout the time, I started doing this about 35 years ago, and push um, every year more and more to be looking at relatives. And I think that the current commissioner, Judge Cass, and the courts are really pushing DCF what relative resources we get. And DCF gets to make the call, though this is an interesting fight, on which relative it is. Because a lot of times you get the male's uh, family, they want the child, and you get the female's family, they want the child. And I, it was particularly problematic in a case I had where there was a, a double homicide by the father. And then the DCF gave the child right away to the mother's parents, but the father's parents then said, well, we never got a chance and we want the child. And so there was a big trial and argument, but it was actually DCF's call. They make the call. And for the most part, I agree that we do. There are times when the department might say, we don't think that you know, Aunt Susie is a good, a good resource for the child. If after, I think it's 45 days, the department is saying, we don't believe with this, we don't agree with this particular relative placement, that relative, I believe, has the right to intervene in the court proceeding <coughs> and seek custody of the child themselves. But we will look at relatives. We'll look at relatives first. Um, there are times that sometimes a child has very specialized needs. There might be a history of, of sexual abuse, it could be an issue in the case, and the family members are not really believing that the child was sexually abused. In that case, there might be a, a very good relative that, that passes all the tests and is vetted and, and looks great on paper, but this child, the, the relatives really not believe that this child was actually sexually abused. The department has to look at whether that's going to be a good emotionally supportive placement for the child. Um, if the child can be placed with a relative home, the department does have licensed foster homes. Never enough of them, but licensed foster homes, that could be a possible placement. There are also therapeutic foster homes for children that require foster care out of relative care, but have specialized needs that they really need a, a higher level of attention and the therapeutic foster homes gone through special training and um, have special support services to help them keep the child in the home. There are, I don't know if there are group homes still, I know um, our commissioner has, has, um, has kind of moved away from the group home setting. 
Um, you know, food pumps happen a lot in, in the delinquency side of it. Uh, and, and I'm not happy about that. Because you get a lot of, for example, um, there's a lot of controversy about a locked facility for young girls who run away. And it, you know, there's so many young girls who do run away. And um, DCF has a sex trafficking unit. And um, a lot of times these young girls get somehow involved in uh, the sex trafficking industry. So when I get a young girl like that, and I'm really, she's really there for her own protection. That, that's what she's there for. Because she won't cooperate, she won't stay where we put her. But now I'm just going to put her in what's called a safe home. Is that still the case? Where she, I know she's going to run away again and possibly cause harm to herself or pick up another charge. And that does happen frequently in the delinquents. If they're not in a place that they agree to say, they leave that safe home and burglarize the, the local neighborhood or, or steal a car from somebody and they're on their way. So You asked the question about the impact of a child removing and that cost-benefit analysis, trying to weigh uh, keeping the child there versus the, the risk of the trauma in removing. Very much a case-by-case -case basis. The case you're talking about really has to do with a case that's probably a neglect petition only and not in order of temporary custody. Order of temporary custody cases, more often than not, tend to be very clear-cut. Um, serious physical injury, sex abuse allegation. The case where there's just a number of you know, there's 14 different factors. The kid's missed 80 days of school, hasn't been to the dentist in, in three years, and a child who's not visible in the community, namely under five years old, and isn't in a preschool. In a case like that, if the court is involved, in all likelihood, there may be uh, a court-ordered psychological evaluation where the parents, child, providers, or information is, is gleaned, and then we ask evaluators who have very cool letters next to their name and supposedly are smarter than we are to tell us what's in the child's best interest and whether that child can be maintained in the home. The preference, of course, is to maintain a child in a home. We don't always have good solutions, and so we just have to go with the safe, safest solution. And we always have to look for example, imminent risk. And imminent risk can also be, and, and this is a little bit of law, uh, this was a theory that really surprised me. Predictive neglect, and, and maybe Attorney Lebowski can talk about it, but if one child's been continuously abused, and mom, we've had some moms, I, I can remember at least one who had at least 10 children, one after the other, and they all ended up having to be taken away. But there is a theory that if, if you don't have the parental skills to parent this one, and now there's another one added, and I'll, I'll let Sherry go from there. We, we have this predictive neglect. Well, um, in general, the, the predictive neglect theory is saying the department does not have to wait for a child to be injured to, to take action. And as Judge Tucker was saying, if you have a history where there's been abuse in, of, of children, serious physical abuse of children in the past, there have been um, a series of terminations of parental rights occurring because of substance abuse or serious physical abuse or sexual abuse in the past, and another child was born into that, that family, the department doesn't have to wait for that child to, to be abused, to be sexually abused. They can file a petition on the basis of the neglect, stating that mother has a, a history, a long history of substance abuse. Um, the department may have information that as recently as, you know, during the, the pregnancy, mother was testing positive for, for drugs. Uh, mother was um, the perpetrator of violence against children in the past and can then bring that, that petition to the court, bring the affidavit to the court, and ask for the immediate removal of the child. Um, again, not having to wait until something actually happens to that child before a court of action. The hospital calls DCF at birth if the mother's meconium, um, or the child's urine, for example, tests positive for opiates, or marijuana, or any drugs, usually it calls me to I'd like to move you guys further um, through the legal process at this point. I just checked out the clock. Um, 
the, let's say we, we've discussed all these different issues and how a child could be removed from their home and placed in alternative care, either through relative placement, therapeutic foster home, regular foster home. Um, what happens? Do you think the department just you know sits and lingers uh, with that child in foster care? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. This idea of permanency for the child is paramount. You don't want children sitting in foster homes um, with continued ties to their biological parents when their parents aren't making the efforts um, to successfully reunify. What ends up happening uh, is that the, um, the Attorney General's office, um, Cherry Lebowski, would end up filing a, a petition for the termination of parental rights for that child to legally sever that tie so that that child could be freed up for adoption if that's what's found to be in, its, in his or her best interest. I have um, up on the slide here, just because it, for my poli-sci students who are here, I think this is a very interesting point. We're talking about DCF, we're talking about the Attorney General's office. These are governmental entities. And when we talk about um, the government involving itself in your family unit, that is significant. It is not something to be taken lightly. Um, and the court has has said uh, here, termination of parental rights is a judicial matter of exceptional gravity and sensitivity. A TPR is the ultimate interference by the state in the parent-child relationship. And although such judicial action may be required under certain circumstances, the natural rights of the parents and their children undeniably warrants deference and absent a powerful countervailing interest protection. So if you've gotten to the point where um, you're at the, the termination stage, that is significant government involvement with this family. Um, and the state would need to show by clear and convincing evidence that this is what is best for the child. Um, and then Judge Cofield would be a, a one of the justices uh, deciding, one of the judges deciding that matter, whether or not that is indeed the best thing for a child, because we don't want children to sit in foster care. Um, we want them to have a sense of permanency. The only thing I'd add to that is um, state and federal law state that if a child has been in the care of the department, um, be moved uh, into a foster home, living with a relative under a period of commitment for a period of, I think it's 15 of the last 22 months, uh, the department is mandated to file a petition unless there's some extraordinary circumstances where on the eve of the application or something like that. To me, 15 months is a, life, is a lifetime. This is, an, is a long period of time. For as an adult, 15 months is you know, not even a year and a half. It's not that long. For a child, for many of them, that's their entire life to be removed at, at, at birth. And um, I think the department and the courts, um, through their oversight, are really pushing the, the, the department as well as pushing the parents to try to address the issues that led to the removal of the child or led to the court involvement address it as quickly as possible so the child will be able to have permanence either returning to their, their family home or moving into an adoptive home. Unfortunately, that's what's necessary. And just recently, juvenile court, uh, the judges were given the privilege, and I consider it a privilege, my favorite part of the job, because as I said, it could, the good, the bad, the ugly, and all we ever saw was the stress of abuse, and we never saw a happy ending, but now, we, see, we do adoptions, and so on Fridays at Juvenile Court, that's a great day because on that day, um, I actually signed the papers for the adoptions of uh, children. And uh, children are told that they're going to their forever parents. Some are old enough to understand and are very excited about going. Others are very young and they're babies, but the families are always so excited to have these children, and it's just very exciting for the whole staff to see these adoptions. Would you rather that they have been able to stay with their biological family? Yes, but at some point you have to decide that that could not happen. Um, there is what's called an open adoption, but that's not under this court's jurisdiction. Many families can come in and say they have, they, just, they define the open adoption. Some parents will say, we will allow the biological parents to get pictures uh, twice a year, or to send birthday cards or Christmas cards. Other parents might actually agree, if they could be in the same family, uh, they might actually agree to visitation. But if there's a breakdown of that relationship, then that's not something that this court would get in. But it just, it's just such a great experience to, to do these adoptions. And I, I can put it together. I see the person from whom the child was taken 
now I see that child going to a family. And it's good to see the whole picture. I want you to know what the courtroom looks like, though. We're being very cordial, and we always are, because we're very professional. But in that courtroom, the first time I walked into a juvenile court, I couldn't believe how many people were in there. And it was all lawyers, mostly, and just the, the people who were facing the um, complaint. Because I'm used to walking in and seeing a courtroom full of defendants, but in this courtroom, I would say that the state spares no expense in the best interest of children. Each parent has an attorney. Then you might have an interpreter if the parents can't speak English. So you, you might have two interpreters and two uh, parents and two lawyers. That's probably about eight people there. And then on the other side, you've got Attorney Lebowski, the AG's office, and they might have, they have the social worker sitting with them and there could be a GAL, a guardian of the item. And so you walk out and there are all these lawyers and you think, my goodness, you know, imagine how much this, this costs. But the state really puts its money where its mouth is about the best interests of children. And Attorney Sandler is a very strong advocate for his side. And he's very professional, but we're not just sitting around having like Coke Zero and talking where we are now, so don't get that impression. Um, is anyone considering being a DCF worker? Nobody? Uh, anyone want to say why? Someone in the back. Uh, I, not to market DCF, but I, I can tell you that um, Notwithstanding, this, you'll notice in front of us, if you can, that uh, Attorney Lebowski has notes, the judge has notes. I don't have any. Um, as a defense attorney, my job is to tell other people what they've done wrong. Uh, so I don't have to prepare. Um, the attorney generals, they do wonderful work. They have to do a lot of prepar preparation. Social workers, these are people who are going into people's homes and removing their children. And they uh, do so without carrying a gun or anything like that. And it's a, it can be a very dangerous job, but incredibly rewarding, well-paying, I might add, also, for people who are in the social work business. Um, but it's, it, it's very rewarding work, I'm told. It can be. It can be incredibly frustrating. Um, but I encourage anybody who has an interest to look into it because uh, like I said, it's a well-paying uh, job. Any other questions? Yes? You asked if anybody wanted to say, like, why they didn't want to go into it. And I just want to say that if, if I was involved in that, every time I saw a kid, I would just want to personally adopt them all. And I don't you think you I do want. have to maintain your boundaries. I adopted you do. two. I don't think I could. I adopted two, and I'm, I'm still looking. Oh. <laughs> I'm, right now, I'm raising my great niece, oh. who's three three years old and I got her when she was three months old and she was I knew she was sent to me because we have the exact same birthday not the same year but the same birthday <laughs> you can uh, you can adopt within your own family even if you feel you can't afford it financially and I want you to know that that would be called a special study adoption subsidized adoption, subsidized adoption. So there I see that it's, it's time to transition to your one o'clock classes and I don't want anybody to be late, but I so appreciate that you guys came today and that you were able to engage in this dialogue with us. I want to thank the panel again for engaging in this dialogue with the students and the faculty members. Thank you so, so much. And if anybody has any questions, uh, we will be here for probably the next five, ten minutes. <laughs>